Today's gospel reading comes from the book of Mark. No food. <laughs> the gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. If you would just honor God by rising to your feet or lifting God up in your hearts. Hear the word of the Lord. There was a rich man, said Jesus, who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and he was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said then, Then Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, then they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. This is the final parable in a long series of parables. Uh, remember, we started in uh, chapter 15 with a lost sheep, a lost coin, and then a son that goes astray, but is found again. In each of these stories, there's a celebration when what was lost is found, and Jesus gives to advice to some people who are at a big party, Important people, when you set your table for dinner, don't just invite your family. Don't just invite your important friends who can invite you back. Invite those who are lame and poor and who have no food, who can never, you can never hope that they'll invite you to dinner because they have no means and the Lord will repay you. After that, we have a story of a shrewd manager who was managing the master's estate. But he heard some rumors that this manager was wasting the master's possessions, and he was fired. But right before he was fired, he went, forgave the debts of his debtors by half, by 20%, hoping for kickbacks. And the, and the master, I can imagine commending the servant. You got me, you dirty dog, <laughs> you got me. That was clever. But he doesn't commend cheating the, the master. He commends his smart thinking and his investment in his future. Now we come to the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Here is a rich man feasting sumptuously every night, eating his fill, wiping the grease on his fingers and throwing the bread to his dogs. And here's Lazarus outside, hoping for a crumb from that table. And he is the feast. The dogs come and lick his sores. He is the feast. It's not surprising that Lazarus dies. And he goes to Abraham's bosom where he's comforted in Sheol, the place of the dead. The rich man also dies and goes to Sheol. But he's in a place of torment. 
Now, this parable doesn't mean that don't be rich. That's not the point of this parable. But you know, when you see the poor all the time, if you live in the city, on every street corner there's somebody looking for a handout. It's easy for those people to become invisible to us. Because we pass them every day. You can't feed them every day. You can't. You can't feed all those people. But they should not lose their humanity to us. Amen? Okay. They cannot lose their humanity to us. So often when we pull up this light, there's somebody with a sign. It's easy not to look them in the eye. It's easy to look away. It's easy not to care. But the Lord says, Invite the poor. Invite the hungry. We know this isn't a parable against being rich because Abraham was one of those rich men. And we find him as a host of this banquet. But he didn't forget the poor. How can you have somebody who sits at your gate every day? When the man was in torment, he knew Lazarus' name. That makes it worse for me. You know their name, you know their suffering there. But you didn't give them anything. On the other hand, maybe it's because he's in jail. Everybody knows everybody there. But either way, isn't it tragic? Isn't it tragic that there can be people at our gate? We know they're starving. We know they're dying. We can't let that continue. You and I were once aliens. But Jesus bought our citizenship in the kingdom of heaven with his own blood. Amen? Amen. You and I were prisoners to sin and death. Those evil thoughts, those deeds, which we still haven't forgiven ourselves for, Jesus paid for them. And while we should have been the ones in prison and in hell, he spent time in hell and rose again to pay for our sins. Friends, you and I are helped by God. You know that's what Lazarus means? Helped by God. Usually in the parables, no other parable does Jesus name anybody. It's always a farmer, a rich man, some boys. But the poor man in this story has a name. And that's his only hope. He is helped by God. Some biblical scholars go as far as to say, because he has a name, maybe, maybe this isn't a parable. What? We know for sure that Jesus told this story for us to learn the point. God wants us to have a care for those in our midst that need our help, that are hungry. <coughs> that are hurry. Amen? I went to a conference this week. Uh, it's called the New Room Conference, and it sounds like a funny name, but uh, when Wesley first established the preaching house, they dubbed it the New Room. Okay. And uh, it was really a taste of heaven. Um, I spent a lot of time in tears. Uh, <laughs> it was it was funny, but we were just singing the first song, a song I've heard on the radio often, but the second line during the chorus, I just started weeping. The line is, oh, the never-ending, all-consuming, endless love of God. It chases me, leaves the 99. Anyway, I, we've just been preaching.
touched on that these past weeks, and um, it hit me how far that Jesus went to rescue me from my sins. And this immense gratitude filled me. I just couldn't help just stop dropping tears. And it didn't stop for three days. <laughs> It went from gratitude, from heartbreak, to the loss. Kids, today, so many of them are in broken homes. They don't know a father that's ever been stable for them. They don't know a mother that's ever been stable for them. There isn't anybody in their lives that they can count on all their lives. These are kids that need to hear that Jesus loves them. That once they allow him in, that he will never leave them. This is a generation that is desperate to know that they are loved by God unconditionally. And our Lord will never leave them or forsake them. The New Room Conference, its, it's purpose is to sow for a great awakening. We've experienced two in America where heaven just breaks out on earth. Do some of you remember when Bob Dylan started recording a Christian album? And all these recording artists who are famous for doing songs about booze and women started recording about Jesus? And recording hymns, that was during the Great Awakening. Um, it, it's uh, a move of God where suddenly people all over start to give their lives to Christ. There was a, a little church in the Hebrides that was dying. Um, and there's these two old ladies, an 82 and an 84 year old woman who couldn't get to church anymore because one of them was blind and one of them suffered so badly from arthritis she couldn't walk her way. And they got the conviction in their hearts that the church and their fathers needed to be filled again. And they started crying out because there was no one under 30 going to that church anymore, no young people. And they prayed and prayed. And then one day, Peggy, the older sister, got a vision. The blind one. She saw people filling that church. And there were young people everywhere and they couldn't get in because there were so many. And people were standing outside trying to hear the message of God. And so they, they called the pastor and said, this is what we saw. And the pastor says, well, what do you want me to do? And she says to them, we want you to pray like we're praying. You go pray in a barn somewhere. One of these farmers will let you to space. And we'll pray here in our cottage. We can't get out. We'll pray every night at 10 o'clock in, in the evening. You and your barn and us here. Every Tuesday and Friday. And they started praying. Four hours. Five hours. Six hours at a time. They would pray until 2 or 3 a.m. I'm going to read you a little something. One of the deacons, this was a Presbyterian church, he wasn't ordained, he was the one who opened the church and closed it after service. <laughs> after praying, one of the deacons stood up, praying for over a month like that, and he reads Psalm 24. Who shall ascend to the hill of God? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity or sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing. Not a blessing, but the blessing of the Lord. Then the young man closed his Bible. And he said, It seems to be so much humbug to be praying as we are praying. To be waiting as we are waiting if we ourselves are not rightly related to God. And he lifted his two hands and prayed, God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? 
Then he fell on his knees and fell into a trance and fallen over lying there on the floor of the barn. At that moment, they were gripped, all of them, by conviction that God sent revival must ever be related to this holiness, must ever be related to godliness. Are my hands clean, Lord? Is my heart pure? That day, a revival broke out and continued for three years. There's a story of a boat heading to America that was just passing by the island and the people on the boat started feeling this conviction and gave their lives to the Lord. And when they landed in America, people discovered that there had been a revival on the boat. There's a village seven miles away and people in the bars suddenly got convicted and left the bar to seek Jesus. There are people in the dance hall in the town, young people, None of them who had gone to church, suddenly feeling the conviction of God and coming out, and they all coming out to the church because they needed to get right with God, and they knew it. That's what an awakening is. It's a revival, not just in one place, not just in one church, but all over. And this is what this conference was praying for. This ministered to me so much because over 20 years ago when I was in college, I prayed for a prophecy and God gave me a vision. I saw four statues facing in towards each other, kind of like Stonehenge. And as I got closer to the scene in my dream, I saw that two of those statues facing each other were praying. And then suddenly the other two started praying too. And I woke up that day and said, God, what the heck did that mean? And God said, because of your prayers and the prayers of those around you, the hearts of stone will become flesh. Those who have never prayed before, those with hardened hearts will begin to pray. It's been so long I've given up on that vision. When I was in college, I thought it was particularly for my college campus. But at this conference, I saw kids representing campuses from all over the nation. And they said, we're praying for revival. I walked into the freshman dorm and I saw 14 kids listening to praise music and on their knees praying for revival. Friends, revival isn't here yet. But it's coming. Because God is answering my prayer and this vision. And people are starting to pray for a renewal of spirit and mind and heart. And for the churches to, to rise up again. I believe that God will bring this in our life. That a powerful following of God's spirit will come. And young people will be drawn again to God and the church. If the trajectory of the church doesn't change, by 2050, half the churches in America will be closed. This generation, many of them are growing up never having gone to church. And half the kids that go to college, that point in their lives, they decide, I'd rather sleep in. I'm not going back. But if God moves, we'll see an awakening where Lady Gaga and and uh, maybe some of the old timers like Madonna, Ariana Grande, will start singing Amazing Grace. It's happened before, and God can do it again. Amen? Amen. Amen. Friends, uh, I've been convicted to pray more. Every day when I show up for church at 8.30, I'm going to be here in the sanctuary instead of the office. And uh, I'm going to be praying. 
If you feel convicted to pray, if you have a need, if you need healing, if you have a son or daughter who is lost, if you need release from something, would you show up and pray with me? And I'll pray for you. You can pray for me. I preach so much better when the congregation prays for me. I feel God's spirit so much more when you are in prayer. Would you seek the Lord? And if you're working, if you're busy, you're doing stuff at 830, while you're driving in, would you make that your time with God? As you're busy getting ready, would you take a moment, write something on your mirror to remind you. Take a moment to seek the Lord, to ask God to do a new thing because a lot of times we, we pray like a rich man in hell. Lord, I'm in such agony. Just a drop of water on my tongue. Friends, the world is on fire and is going to be consumed. We can't be satisfied with a drop of water. We've got to pray for God's Spirit to fall in a mighty way for a flood of the Spirit. Amen? Let's pray together. Almighty God, we confess our utter lack and our desperate need. We need you, Jesus. Lord, breathe your life into us. Restore our, our bodies. Restore our church. Restore our spirits. God, reach out to this generation that is so lost, that is so hurting. They don't know where to turn. God, have your way. Lord, wake your suffering servant, the church. Wake this giant and cause us to pray. Give us a hunger. Lord, we need you. We submit ourselves to you, all of us, in Jesus' name.